thanks everyone. I'm uh, extremely excited to be here. I am a native Californian, and uh, I love coming back here for the weather. It's just fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, as, as I always tell people, I'm now on year uh, 22 of my two-year plan to try out New York. Uh, and uh, somehow, somehow that seems to have stuck, but uh, the Golden State is, is, has a special place for me. Uh, so very happy to be here. And uh, you know, as Dan said, one of my real passions in life, uh, besides uh, uh, entrepreneurship and besides Return Path and my family, uh, is advising um, new entrepreneurs. Uh, I write a blog uh, that's called Only Once, uh, which the, the name of which came from uh, a blog post that Fred Wilson, who's one of my board members and investors, wrote um, sometime after he started his blog, uh, which was called You're Only a First-Time CEO Once. Uh, so uh, I am still a first-time CEO, although uh, it has been a little over 10 years now. Uh, but uh, advising other, um, other young entrepreneurs, first-time entrepreneurs, is a real passion of mine. Um, and in fact, uh, this, the Seed Camp guys here tonight, I see Saul, I don't know if Reshma's here, but uh, when I was over there um, uh, mentoring uh, late last year, um, I met a bunch of great companies, three of whom are here tonight. So the guys from Codility and Wondergraphs and Jubilee are all here. It was nice to see them. Um, and uh, I did a uh, mentor last year in uh, Boulder at Techstars for the first time. Uh, and the company that, uh, that I mentored there, SendGrid, is here, Isaac. Uh, and uh, by the way, when we get into talking about email deliverability, uh, not only uh, do you need to think about deliverability, you probably need to work with SendGrid um, and possibly Return Path as well, although we've, uh, we're now uh, partnering to deliver our two complementary services together. So uh, it is, uh, it's great to see a bunch of the entrepreneurs that I have worked with in the past here. Um, so as Dan said, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the story of Return Path, and, uh, which is not specifically about email deliverability, but more about uh, the path that we've had over the last 10 years building the business, and then uh, spend the second half of the time talking about email deliverability a bit, and um, hopefully leave plenty of time for Q&A. Um, Return Path, for those of you who have never heard of us before, uh, we are in the business of email deliverability, which is essentially helping mailers, right, helping companies like yours, achieve 100% what we call inbox placement um, of their outbound emails. So if you're sending emails to your customers, uh, whether those emails are marketing or content newsletters or transactional messages or invite a friend messages, um, our job is to make sure not we don't deliver the mail. Um, that's one of the things that SendGrid does. Uh, but we make sure that the mail actually gets where it's supposed to get. Uh, we have uh, two different applications. We have a SaaS platform that's a bunch of testing tools and analytics, and we also have uh, the Internet's largest whitelist and certification program. Uh, we also work with ISPs and filtering systems all over the world hand-in-hand -hand, uh, to help them fine-tune the accuracy of their filters. So we not only work with senders to make sure they're following best practices, but we work with receivers to make sure that they recognize best practices uh, when they get sent into their network. Uh, we have clients of all shapes and sizes and verticals and, and countries. Uh, we work with big guys like Fidelity and eBay and Facebook, LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, we work with startups as well. Uh, and um, in fact, I was invited tonight or introduced to this group tonight by um, a client of ours, Bill Shrink. I don't know if Peter's here. I haven't seen him yet. but. Um, uh, we uh, have plenty of, uh, of early stage clients as well, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more at the end this evening. Uh, just a, a, some quick stats about Return Path, the company. Uh, we were founded in December of 1999. Uh, we have uh, investors slash board members that include uh, Fred Wilson from Union Square Ventures, Brad Feld. Is Brad here? I know he was supposed to come or thinking about coming. Uh, Brad Feld from um, Foundry Group and Mobius Venture Capital. Uh, Greg Sands from Sutter Hill Ventures here in the Valley, and um, a couple, uh, couple of other uh, smaller investments from SAP Ventures uh, and Four Rivers Group here locally. Uh, the uh, company this year is going to do about $35 million in revenue. We're profitable and cash flow positive, uh, which is a relatively new thing for us. It took us quite a while to get to that milestone. Uh, and along the way, we've been in lots of different businesses, which I'll talk about a little bit. They've all been related to uh, email, email publishing, email marketing. Um, so we'll do about $35 million this year. And businesses that we've spun off into a separate company will do about $15 million this year, uh, all of which was return path at one point. Uh, we have about 160 people. Uh, we have about 50 openings right now. Um, so we are hiring like crazy and growing like crazy. Uh, we have uh, offices in Mountain View, uh, New York, Boulder, London, Paris, and Berlin. 
Uh, and um, if things go well over the next couple of months, uh, probably Beijing as well. Uh, so that's a little bit about the business. Uh, just to tell you about the story and, and uh, kind of the, the journey of Return Path. Uh, Return Path 1.0, uh, the original, original business, is something that we don't even do anymore. Uh, but uh, understanding two minutes about it is probably instructive uh, in terms of understanding what the company is all about and, and where we've been. Uh, the original business, which we did for the first few years of our life, was something called ECOA, or email change of address. And essentially, the concept that we had at the beginning was, hey, people change their email address all the time, uh, much more fluidly than they move homes or apartments. And there's kind of no central mechanism or clearinghouse on the internet for people to register a change of address, uh, to communicate it to their friends, and um, and commercially then to communicate it to businesses with whom they have uh, an email relationship. So uh, the experience that I had at Movie Phone, among other things, uh, we built uh, what was then a state-of-the-art uh, email marketing application. It's sort of a little silly to look at it now, uh, the screenshots I have of it. Uh, but at the time, uh, it was state-of-the-art email application called Movie Mail back in 1996. And uh, we accumulated a list of, I don't know, half a million subscribers. And uh, every time we did a mailing, we got a bunch of bounces. and you know, we sort of set up this crude algorithm, and if, you know, if someone bounced a few times, we would just delete them. Uh, and there was kind of no other way to, to reconnect with that customer. Uh, so that was uh, the original business concept. As I said, we did that for a few years. Um, it did OK. Uh, we got it to a point where uh, it, uh, you know, it was doing a few million dollars in revenue, but it was very, very difficult to scale the business. Um, I think we had accumulated by the end 20 million registrations. And it turned out for us to really be effective, we needed 100 million. And uh, we just couldn't figure out how to get from A to B. Uh, so in 2001, uh, uh, so we started in December of 99, and then the world fell apart about five months later. So we didn't even have a chance to get things off the ground before um, half of our beta clients went out of business. And um, in 2001, we consolidated with a direct competitor of ours uh, based in Boulder, Colorado, which is why we have an operation there now, uh, which is a company called Veripost. And um, you know, that was a, a very opportunistic play. We were two small startups. We were both pre-revenue. We were both struggling. We were both trying to get funded. Uh, and uh, my original investor, which was Fred, Veripost's original investor, which was Brad, and myself and the other CEO got together and said, look, you know, this is probably the only way to move forward in the middle of what then was kind of the nuclear winter uh, for, uh, for dot coms. Uh, so we kept running with that uh, business model, consolidated the competitor, got it to a few million in revenue, and uh, then you know, found ourselves kind of in late 2002 scratching our heads saying, you know what, this thing is OK. Uh, but it's not great, and it's not going to be you know, the, the home run that we thought it was. Uh, so we did a pivot. And we took a hard look at ourselves, and we said, OK, you know, what do we have around the table that's great? Well, we have uh, phenomenal investors. We have a great management team. And we have a great client list. Uh, so we had done a very good job uh, in the early days uh, of building a, just a terrific client list. eBay was our first client. And, uh, you know, we had telcos and tech companies. Microsoft was a client. IBM was a client. Uh, so we had this very, very good client list, good expertise, and quite frankly, a, as I think Brad or Fred, one of them colorfully put it, a shitty little business. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, we, we just looked at each other very honestly, management and board, and said, okay, we got two choices. Um, at this point, no one wants to put more money into this thing as it is. So uh, we can sell it and make a little bit of our investment back or all of our investment back and call it a day. Or we can take the assets we've got and try to do something interesting with it. And uh, we were all sort of very enthusiastically said, no, you know, this, this company can be the, the platform for lots of other stuff in email. So we were fairly successful at, at, um, at, you know, at running all of those businesses. But we woke up one day in late 1997 with just a giant headache. And um, uh, one of our other board members uh, said at the time, well, the problem is you guys are running the world's smallest conglomerate. <laughs> and, uh, and we sort of took a step back and we said, yeah, that is what we're running. And that's really not, you know, it served us well, right? We got the business to scale and we got it to be worth uh, a lot of money and more than the investment dollars had totaled to date. Uh, but uh, we weren't having fun. The senior management team was going crazy because we felt like we were running five different businesses or at least three different businesses. Uh, and uh, what had happened was the operating leverage and more important, the customer leverage that we had expected when we put all these things together just didn't pan out. So I think we had a model when we started this, uh, this uh, M&A and, and kind of diversification process that said the average client was going to come in the door buying not all five products, but they were going to buy 2.5 products or 2.2 products. 
Um, and it turned out that the average client was buying 1.05 products. Uh, and um, what it turned out was even when we had the same company buying multiple services from us, it wasn't the same buyer at the company. Um, so you know, we'd have Procter & Gamble using four of our different products, but we'd have four different sales uh, that required four different sales people and four different sales calls. So the, the leverage wasn't there. Uh, so Return Path 3.0 was the pivot that we engineered in early 2008, so just two years ago now. Uh, where uh, we just went through this, this soul searching process and we said, hey, we got all these different businesses. Uh, what's working? What's not working? And what do we want to do to optimize shareholder value? Uh, and uh, uh, you know, we, we essentially had one business that was thriving uh, and doing much better than the other ones, which is the uh, business we're still in today. And uh, you know, that business had been, we recognized at that point, hamstrung by the presence of the other businesses. So, you know, we had five different businesses. At any one point in time, one or two of them weren't doing well and sucked all the oxygen out of the room. And the one that was doing well didn't really get the attention it needed. It didn't get the capital. It didn't get the management focus. Uh, and it didn't get the sales focus. And um, e despite that, it was doing really well. So uh, we also had a problem that I think we had kind of confused our uh, corporate positioning message at some point because these businesses were so different. And um, Return Path was kind of synonymous with email stuff. Uh, and it's a little hard to sell something called email stuff. So in uh, early 2008, we cleared all the clutter away. Uh, we uh, sold one business. We shut one business down. We divested other businesses and ended up with the uh, whitelisting and deliverability business that we have today. And uh, so we just kicked off, um, as a company, what we call Return Path 4.0, which is expanding from a, a simplified but very powerful and profitable core business. And uh, we have. Uh, taken great care over the last few months as we kind of think about our future to refocus the business, to simplify it further, and um, to really redraw the boundaries of the business. Uh, so we, uh, we love the business we're in. We're the market leader. We think we have a lot of room to grow. Uh, but uh, we also have some very exciting plans in the works uh, to uh, potentially increase our total available market five to ten times from what we thought it was a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, you know, very simply put, uh, we're talking about a very horizontal kind of expansion. So our classic customer uh, is the marketer, the publisher, the social network, the, the company that is sending out a tremendous amount of mass email from a single platform. What we've decided is that the thing we're experts in, world class, probably best in class, is solving this problem of email deliverability. Uh, and solving a couple of related problems, we are about to come to market with a phishing and spoofing solution. Uh, we have a couple other things in the works as well. Uh, and instead of focusing 100% of our attention on the mass mailer market, over the next couple of years, we're going to be versioning our products for other types of mail servers. So our objective is going to be, if you own a mail server anywhere in the world, whether it's sending out mass mail, uh, corporate mail, like an exchange server, um, hosted email, like uh, you know, hosted exchange or, uh, or Google Apps, uh, you need to be working with us because all mail servers have the same problem. Uh, so that sort of brings us uh, to, uh, to where we are today. And you know, when I think back before I sort of transition and talk about deliverability a little bit, uh, when I think about uh, the last 10 years, you know, we've really done a few very successful what I would call pivots from you know, not jumping from one thing to another thing, but pivoting from one thing to um, an adjacent thing. Uh, you know, people do ask me when I tell the story of the business, well, how, did, how were you able to accomplish that? What were the successful ingredients of the pivot? Uh, and um, you know, it, I, I look at all of the stakeholders in the business, and, and those are the ingredients. So we could not have done it without a tremendously engaged uh, employee base that had developed very rich intellectual capital. Uh, and we're just you know, psyched about the company and happy to come to work every day. Um, we could not have done it without our investors, and investors not just because they had checks and checkbooks and gave us money, uh, but investors who were great strategic partners and who really helped us make the decisions that drove the business over the years. Um, and uh, you know, kind of equally important uh, was our customer base. Uh, you know, our customers drove us into every new opportunity uh, that we've ever been in. And being in front of our customers and asking them questions and uh, sitting back and listening and letting them do the talking um, has been transformational multiple times in our company's history. So that's kind of the first half. I don't know if, I don't know if you have a point of view about whether I should do Q&A about that stuff and then do deliverability or just keep going through and just do all Q&A at the end? OK. Uh, so 
I thought I'd spend the next few minutes talking about um, the subject matter of return path, which is email deliverability. And um, I, I guess you know before I get into you know some things which are more about the you know traps and you know tips and tools and things. Um, I would talk for a couple of minutes about the evolution of our business because I think the evolution of our business in terms of the specifics of deliverability actually say a lot about uh, the things you have to do to be really, really good at email and to make sure that your emails don't get blocked and filtered. Um, when we started in this business in 2003, um, essentially we had a nice little SaaS business. A, uh, uh, you know, the software platform that was a monitoring and analytics tool and testing tool. And uh, you know, we got into the business because a bunch of our customers in our legacy business said to us, hey, you know, when I send one of my campaigns to my AOL address, sometimes it doesn't get there. And I wonder if this is a broader problem. And I asked my friend who has a Yahoo account if they get my email. And sometimes they do, and sometimes they don't. So the first part of our business, which has evolved into you know, an, an enormous part of the business, um, is the SaaS application to um, help our customers test campaigns before they uh, send them out. Uh, into the wild. Uh, they will uh, run them through our system. We run them through a battery of filters. So we're you know, running a, essentially a giant lab that has most of the major filters in it. Um, we tell our customers whether the mail passed, whether it failed, um, give them reason codes where we can get reason codes, um, show them what the email looks like in every major different email client. So if they're HTML errors because the different engines render HTML differently, um, we provide that. And, um, and then the second piece of the tool is monitoring deliverability. So where we had a client say, hey, I don't think it's getting into AOL because it didn't come to me in AOL. Um, what we've done is we've signed up thousands of accounts at domains all over the world. And our clients mail their campaigns to those accounts. Um, we can provide them alerting and reporting around what percent are showing up in inbox versus junk mail folder versus blocked at the gateway um, with a more statistical sample than saying, hey, I didn't get my uh, email in my AOL account. Um, so we launched with this software business. And monitoring is you know, a really important part of email deliverability. Because if you, well, testing and monitoring. If you're not testing ahead of time, you're not optimizing your chance of success. And if you're not monitoring, uh, then you really have no idea what's going on out in the wild other than anecdotal. Uh, and as you might imagine, the minute we uh, started having clients up and running and using our platform uh, and telling them that they were getting blocked at Yahoo, what did they do? They came to us and said, well, why am I getting blocked at Yahoo? And what can you do about that for me? Uh, and you know, fundamentally, those questions and our customers asking us those questions and us listening to our customers got us into uh, two adjacencies, or really three adjacencies, services, um, reputation data, and ultimately whitelisting. Uh, so our solution now for some clients includes some degree of professional services, which is helping troubleshoot problems. Not all problems are obvious. Uh, not all problems can be diagnosed in a tool. Um, and uh, reputation data is worth spending a couple minutes on um, as well. So I'll come back to that. And then whitelisting, which I think most people understand the concept, which is basically Return Path runs uh, this registry of, uh, you know, of good guys. And uh, there's a process for applying and qualifying to be known as a good guy. Uh, and if you're on the list, any of the ISPs that use the list um, basically bypass all the filters, put you in the inbox, and on in most cases, which is a you know, big challenge uh, in the inbox today. Um, and uh, our whitelist is used by you know, Yahoo and Hotmail and lots of the other major carriers and mailbox operators worldwide. Uh, but the reputation part of our business is, is a pretty important thing to understand in terms of thinking about your own deliverability and your own email programs. And I guess the way to think of there are a couple ways to think about the reputation uh, business and your email reputation. Um, the, uh, the model that's probably the easiest to understand is the model of the credit bureau, or the FICO score. Right, so every one of us, um, at least in the US, has a FICO score. And I assume there's some equivalent in, uh, in Japan and, uh, and in countries in Europe. You have a credit score. And the way that credit score is compiled is that every financial institution essentially pools their data with one of three different credit bureaus, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion. Uh, and they're pooling all of this disaggregate data about you. So all they send is your social security number and financial stuff about you. How big your mortgage is, how big your credit card bill is, how much of a balance you carry on it, how timely your payments are, um, your student loans, your car loans, sort of the basic financial data. The credit bureaus uh, crunch that data. They aggregate it. They statistically model it. They normalize it. And they come up with a score for you, which is how credit worthy you are on a scale of whatever, 300 to 800. 
they provide that data back to banks and insurance companies. And banks and insurance companies look at your credit score and make a decision about whether or not to accept you as a customer or which product to sell you based on how creditworthy you are. Uh, just like each of you as an individual has a credit score, any IP address you mail from uh, or any domain that you mail from also has a credit score. Uh, it's not called a FICO score and it's not, cre not ca called a credit score, uh, but it's uh, the, basically the same concept. So the version of that that Return Path runs, if you think of us as a credit bureau, is called your sender score. Um, and we're not the only reputation scoring engine in the world. There are other ones as well. Um, most filtering software applications have proprietary um, scoring algorithms, and a lot of ISPs have built their own too. So what we do with the reputation um, portion of our business is we collect all the disaggregate data from ISPs about your mailing behavior, your IP's mailing behavior, how much you sent, when you sent it, how much of it got blocked, how much of it was to unknown users, how many spam traps you hit, how much of it users complained about, how much of it users uncomplained about, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A very long list of, uh, of disaggregate data elements. We have terabytes of that data flowing into our system every day in real time from about 60 different carriers and mailbox operators and filtering software packages around the world. We aggregate it, crunch it, normalize it, uh, and provide it back to uh, the ISPs that work with us in the form of a whitelist and also in the form of a blacklist. Uh, but more important for our clients, uh, we provide them with that raw data as well. Um, you can actually get a bunch of it for free on a website that we run called senderscore.org, um, which I think is on that handout somewhere. Um, but uh, you know, clients of ours get more of it or better of it or um, you know, access to more real time or alerts or things like that. Uh, but essentially, even the free version at senderscore.org gives you a snapshot of your email credit worthiness. And that's the information that ISPs use when their machines make decisions about whether to filter your mail or not. 